Hey folks, welcome to Advent of Code 2023, Day 3. Um, so I think it's uh, safe to say with this problem finished that this has been the hardest problem so far. And I'm not sure what's going on with uh, Advent of Code this year, but um, so far we've gotten some pretty difficult problems, uh, all things considered, being week one. So I'm not sure if these are some outliers that he's kind of throwing curveballs at us so that it'll be there's some more challenges early on, uh, or if this is a hint that as we get deeper into this year that they're going to get really, really hard. Uh, or maybe there'll be a few sitters later on. I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, uh, today was uh, pretty difficult. Um, it like it's not conceptually not a terribly difficult problem to understand what you're trying to do but it's just a lot of kind of fiddliness involved in it in uh, getting to a solution um maybe it's the fact that i was doing this on a sunday morning a kind of a groggy sunday morning but uh yeah i d didn't arrive at i don't think a really elegant solution it's it works um and it has some like some good stuff in it but it's i wouldn't say that it's a super smart efficient or elegant solution so with that said, let's have a look at our uh, problem statement and then have a look at some code. Um, so, day three, gear ratios. So, uh, we're with our elf that we were playing our game with the last time. Um, we've now reached a gondola lift station uh, that says it'll bring us to the water source, which you remember is for our snow machine, I guess. Um, but the gondolas aren't working. Uh, so you meet uh, an elf who tells you that um, there's a part missing for the engine for the uh, gondola machine, but it um, uh, yeah, there's a part missing, and you just know which one it is. So you have an engine schematic, and your job is basically to go through the engine schematic and figure out what part is missing. So the engine schematic is our puzzle input, which is a grid like this. So there's numbers, there's uh, dots, periods, and then there's other symbols in here. And basically what we've been told is that this is sort of meant to be like a visual representation of the engine and that a symbol represents where a part is and then the numbers are represent the part number if they're adjacent to one. So you can almost imagine it as like, you know, in a, like an Ikea assembly thing where you've got like a number and maybe a little arrow that you know, goes to a thing and that's denoting the part number of what that thing is, that sort of thing. So that's basically what this is um, sort of representing. Um, yeah, so our job is we need to go through this, uh, this schematic and we need to figure out what all the part numbers are. And at the end of it, um, we're basically going to do our test. We're going to add all the numbers together that we get out of it and then that'll give us uh, an answer. So in this case, what they tell you is that the valid part numbers are any number that is adjacent to a symbol in the grid. So if you basically, if you were to scan through this grid and you find a symbol, if you stop here, you can look in all directions around it. So it goes up, down, left, right, and diagonals. If you see a number there, then this entire number is a valid part number for the thing. So in this case here, see we've got this 114 here. That's not actually adjacent to this star symbol. So it's not a valid part number. So we can just basically ignore that. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so that's, we go basically have to go through this whole list, identify all of the valid part numbers. Then once we have all the valid part numbers, we sum them all together and that gives us our answer. So in this example, uh, 114 and 58, are not valid part numbers because they're not adjacent to any symbol. Um, so yeah, uh, like if you think about this from the start, the first thing that would make this an easy problem would be if say we were only interested in the single character that it was adjacent to. That that makes this a pretty easy problem then because you just need to run through it, uh, find the symbols and then just check the eight cells around it grab the numbers out of them and then those are like your part numbers and that's it but what happens here is obviously so we can go through that we can find our star here we'll come up and say oh we find seven is an adjacent one but seven isn't the answer it's the entire number that it's part of which is four six seven so you have to find the location for where it touches it and then you have to figure out along that line what the actual number that it is uh, is touching it so like if you were to 
So yeah, if we're here as a good example, we can go up and we sign six and then you go, okay, well now I need to keep checking. We need to check to the left and the right and you need to see what the full number is. So in this case, you have to go up and check left and say, oh, there's nothing there. So that's fine. So then you go, you know, see it's six and then you go, okay, let's check right. We see a three. Okay, let's check right again. We see a three. Okay, then we check right again. Okay, there's nothing there. So the number is six, three, three. Um, so that's the kind of like parsing logic that we're having to implement for this, which just makes it more difficult. It's not, again, it's not a conceptually difficult thing. It's just sort of fiddly. Um, so yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Um, let's have a look at some code and see how I implemented that. Uh, so right, first things first, uh, I define so this is like a, a two dimensional array type problem. Um, as in like a grid, you have X and a Y and everything's populated in there. Um, the thing that I found in general with these advent of code problems is if you were to implement this as a two dimensional array, in this case, it will it would work fine. You just basically loop through it and check all the values. Um, but there are points where the solutions, especially later on in advent of code, normally lead you towards you're not going to be able to use a 2D array for this because there's going to be so many points or so much data that you're basically just going to blow up the size of the array and you wouldn't be able to actually operate on it and like just iterating through it alone would take far too long. So what I do kind of almost by default now is when there's a 2D array problem, I try and break it down to something where I don't have to store an entire two-dimensional array to represent all the data. So with that said, I've got two data structures that I've created. One is a, it's a, a Ruby hash or a dictionary or a hash map um, for all the numbers and one for all the symbols. So this is a pattern that I've come across that I think works quite well in the past where you make a hash or a dictionary or whatever where the key is the XY coordinate and then the value is whatever value you want to store to represent. So in this case, I have a, a, a dictionary of all the numbers where I'll store the XY coordinates and I have a dictionary of all of the symbols where I'll store the XY coordinates. So the first part is to populate those dictionaries. So we'll iterate through our input file, check each line, go through every character. Um, we can skip if we find a character is a dot because they don't mean anything in this instance. Um, if we have a number from zero to nine or character number from zero to nine, we'll add that into the numbers list with the X, Y coordinate. And then anything else we add as a symbol into the list because we're not told, we're just told that a dot doesn't count as a symbol and a number is a number. So anything else, should just be a symbol, I suppose. Um, okay, so we now have our two lists. We have a list of all of the numbers and we have a list of all of the symbols. So the first thing we should do is we should go through all of the symbols and we should try and find in those eight squares around it, are there any numbers near them? Because we know that if we find a single digit anywhere in those eight, it is connected to a larger number. So in this example, say if you found just a single digit, so it could be a single digit number, so just one character, so that would be fine. It also could be a two digit number or it could be a three digit number. Now that's a complete assumption that there could be, that three digits is the biggest you can go to. Um, in this case, it happens to be, I think that it can only be three digits. Um, I'd love to see other inputs to know is that 100% true, but the sample only has three and my input only has the largest uh, number continuous characters of three. So I assume that's the case. Um, but yeah, so we know that if we encounter in those, any of those eight squares, if we encounter a single digit, we know that it is either the number or it's part of a larger number. So there we know that those numbers that we've identified are the only ones that we're actually going to be ever interested in. So any other number that's in our big list of numbers, we don't care about it because um, it's not connected to anything else. So it doesn't matter. Um, so with that in mind, the way we do that or the way I've done it is I basically loop through every single symbol that we have. So remember, this is a key breaking down our X, Y coordinates, and these are our check locations. So this is this very simple grid pattern check. So it checks uh, up and down, left and right, and the, the two diagonals. Um, and effectively what I've done is I've just made another key out of those to make eight different keys to check, which is the the, the circle around it. Um, what I do then is I add to this adjacent numbers uh, hash. So this is 
it's another hash of the numbers, except in this case, what it is, is it's only the adjacent ones that we'll be interested in. And the way I can, the way I do that is I go through here, I check, uh, are, is there a number at that location? If there is a number at that location, then I know it's an adjacent one, so I can pop it in. Um, so yeah, that builds us up another list, another dictionary of just the numbers, uh, that are adjacent to a symbol, or at least just the digits that are adjacent to a symbol, right? So the next part then is once we know which numbers are adjacent to a symbol, then what we have to do is we have to figure out, well, what's the entire number? Is it just a single character? Is it two characters? Is it three characters? What is the actual part number then out of that? Um, so this is kind of what got my brain cooking a little bit. I, there's definitely a better way to do this. So I've broken this into basically three distinct steps. The first one is identify our numbers and symbols. The next one is figure out which numbers are or part of a number is adjacent to a symbol. And then the last part is figure out what the entire number is based off a single character that you have from that number. Right. So at this point, then that's, uh, this is kind of, it's a little bit difficult. This isn't super nice, but it, it works doesn't fine. So we know that we have uh, for any of those adjacent symbols we know or adjacent numbers we know that we have a single character and we know its coordinates so based on that we need to try and figure out we need to look to the left of it and we need to look to the right of it to see what other characters are in the original list so um i can maybe i'll just type it out here It'll be a little bit easier to see so if we imagine if we have dot and then we've got one and we've got two and we've got three and we've got dot so i'm gonna space these out a bit so in these positions, let's say for example, this is our uh, our our uh, the the one that we detected. So this is our adjacent number. So from here, I know that looking at this, I know it's one two three. So if I'm in the very center, how do I determine what that actually is? Well, I need to look to the left and I need to look to the right to see what other characters are there. So if I look to the right, I detect this three. So I know that's part of the number. And then if I look to the right again, I detect a dot, which I know isn't part of the number. So I can just stop there. But then I also need to look to the left to see what else is part of the number. So if I look to the left, I see a one, that's fine. Look to the left again, I see another dot. So I know I can stop there. And I know I've detected three numbers, one, two, three. And then I can basically combine those together to make a single number out of it. So that's a simple case. And that's like one of the nicest cases. But the thing is, it's not all three digits. It can be one digit, it can be you know, uh, it can be one digit, it could be two digits, it could be one, but it could be three, whatever. So the other cases you could have, say we could have something like this, where it's like this. So in this case, my three here is what I've detected first. So now I need to look to the left twice to find that. And if I look to the right, any amount of times, I'm going to find uh, dots. So I know that I can ignore those. Anyway, that is to say that there is a pattern that you need to check here. There's basically three different uh sort of patterns you can check like you know two to the left in the center or two to the right and then see what's there uh, but then you could also have a case like this say so this is what you could end up detecting so if i was to look at say just this window i wouldn't see any number or i'd see two single numbers i'd see a three and a four it's like but how do i know which one it is so there's, there's there's a whole bunch of edge cases in here but ultimately all we need to do is Start on the number that we started on, where we centered, check two to the left, check two to the right, stop if we find a dot, or and then and then don't continue, so leave, leave it there, and then check the other side and go from there. And then we'll always make it. And it doesn't matter then if there's two characters, one character, or three characters, you'll either just stop early or you'll stop earlier if you've got less characters, basically. <sighs> yeah, so that's not... Oh, it's it's not super clear. It took me a little while to get my head around this, but that's how I've ended up rationalizing it, and that's what I've implemented here. Um, anything else on that? I'm trying to think of the other edge weird cases that I found while going through this. Uh, yeah, no, there isn't. Okay, so the code then. Uh, so yeah, I have a list of what are going to be my final part numbers. Um. I go down through my adjacent numbers again. I split them out to get the XY coordinates. Um, I check that against the numbers list. If it isn't a number, then I can skip on. 
there is a case you'll see where that comes in later it's not not super important it actually doesn't make a difference to the outcome in the end but uh, i just for completeness it's in there um so the first thing i do is i make another array which will store each number that i find as i check to the left and the right uh, i put in the seed number the starting number and then importantly i delete that location from the overall list of numbers and uh, this is important so that you don't end up duplicating stuff as you look around because there's cases where you've got two sets of numbers that are right beside each other and they're separated in the middle by say a symbol character in that case if you start looking to the left and also start looking to the right you will they'll overlap each other um but you need to be careful about that because if you were to say go oh every time i see a number i'm going to remove it from my overall list of numbers if you're to do that every single time you detect a number then you're going to drop numbers that overlap with each other and you don't want to do that either again <laughs> nuanced but yeah we're in the way i've programmed it that's actually a, that's a serious problem um so anyway yeah as i said we're checking to our right we check to our left so it's just two cases. We know we have the centered number, so we just need to look two to the right and then two to the left. So we increment the X and we decrement the X. We check if there's anything there. So if there's a, if we get a nil, which nil in this case will be the dot case basically, then we know we can, uh, we can exit because we're not gonna find anything else to the right. Anything we do find else to the right, if there was a symbol further down the line, uh, or if there was a number further down the line, we know it's not connected to the other to this one that we're looking at um because there was a, a space in between them obviously uh so yeah we check to the right we check to the left uh if we do find a number that's there we delete it out of the numbers list and we add it to our little array and yeah that's it so we check to the right check to the left by the end of this we should end up with an array that has like that just has numbers in it so it'll either be you know uh It'll either be three characters long, two characters long, or one character long. Uh, and then at the end of it, we just join them together, and then I'm just casting it to an integer, and that works fine to give you just the number. And then we stick that into this list of part numbers that we have, the overall list out here. At the very end, then, we just do a sum operation on that, and that spits out our answer. Um, so we can run that. Run uh, three, one sample so oh. not oh not dot slash run oh, dot slash run there you go and that's the that's the example answer uh input my input runs yeah and it's pretty slow <laughs> 0 0.03 seconds not not very fast at all for this uh, but it works does the job whatever um so yeah okay that's part one uh Let's move on and have a look at part two. So for part two, they don't, it doesn't get, it's not wildly different. Um, I had to make just a few small tweaks to how I organized this and then uh, part two worked pretty well. Um, or I should actually say that the thing, the assumption that I'm saying about the three, two or one digit number thing, that only really makes a difference to this part of the tests, down, this part of the code down here. So. If you are to make an assumption about how long each number could be, uh, this is where it would make have an impact. So the amount of digits that I check to the left and right has to be basically so that at all, at all bounds that you would go out to the left and right, you'll cover possi the possibility of the number being that long. So in this case, it's, it's three characters. I know I'm starting at one, so I just need to go out one, two more characters. If it was five, you'd have to go out one, two, three, four more characters and so on and so forth. So this simplifies it if I'm just making the assumption that it's three and I think that's a good assumption in this case. It happens to be a correct assumption in this case. So that works fine. Okay, so part two, let's have a look at the second part. So that works and your gondola starts moving. Uh, you're on the way but you're moving really really slowly so you pick up a help telephone and uh, in the gondola and you talk to the elf on the other end and they say that the problem with the engine wasn't just that it was missing a part it was also that some of the gear ratios inside the machine are wrong so you need to figure out what all the gear ratios are inside the machine 
So they tell us that a gear ratio is defined in the schematic by any star symbol that is adjacent to exactly two part numbers. Um, so that defines a gear ratio. Uh, so the way you'll get your answer in the end then is you'll find every gear ratio pair in the schematic. You will multiply each gear ratio together and then sum them all up and that'll give you your answer. So in our sample, we've got uh, 35 and 467 here. And they're uh, connected or they're uh, both adjacent to a star and they're not, there's nothing else adjacent to them. So those two are a gear ratio. Uh, we've got 617 down here, which is adjacent to a star, but there's just a single value, so it's not a gear ratio. And then down here, we've got 755 and 598, and they're adjacent to a star, and there's only two of them, so they are a gear ratio. Uh, and then if there's a if there was an, a third or a fourth or a fifth also, or a third or a fourth, I don't know, can there be a fifth? Maybe, yeah, whatever. Adjacent to it, they wouldn't be either, so it's just two. Um, okay, so... How do we do that? The first thing I think that we're going to think of doing is we can discard all other symbols now, except for star symbols, which kind of uh, reduces our uh, search space by quite a lot that we have to work on. So if we have a look at the code, the first thing that I've done for that is up here at the very start of our uh, logic where I build up our two uh, sets. We still need all the numbers, so that's fine. We'll pull in all the numbers. But the only characters that we're interested in now are the star characters. So uh, instead of this was just an else before where I didn't care what characters I found uh, and I'd add them all to the list. Now I only want to add the star characters to the list because that's all I'm interested in. So I do that. I add all the star characters to a list and that's fine. Uh, so the next thing that I need to do is still we need to find all the adjacent ones, but there's an extra little bit in there where now I need to know what numbers are grouping together to be adjacent to what symbol. So to do that, what I've done is, so in the first part uh, where we figured out our adjacency, I didn't care what they were adjacent to because all that mattered was that they were adjacent to a symbol. But now I actually do care because I want to group together what numbers are adjacent to the specific symbol so I know how many are adjacent to any given symbol. So I make a slight modification to this method or to this part of the code that figures out the adjacency. And what I do is, if I find an adjacency, I add it into, so we're still using like a dictionary to model this, except instead now it's sort of a nested dictionary. So the first key that we put in is the location for our symbol. And then underneath that location for the symbol, we're gonna put in all of the, the points that are adjacent to that. So it's the same thing. We figure out what ones are adjacent, but in this case, we're just grouping them into uh, a bucket underneath that symbol. Um, and that's it. That's really, this is really the key difference because this is what is going to allow me to figure out how many numbers are adjacent to a given symbol. Um, so then when we come down to our final part down here, where we're parsing uh, out, trying to figure out the full number itself, uh, it's basically the same thing again, except again, now it's just one nesting deeper so that I do it for each uh, grouping that I figured out. I figure out what the full numbers are. Uh, and then at the end of it, that just gives me, that gives me uh, another like hash out of it, except in this case, each, the value of each hash is an array of numbers and they're an array of part numbers. So I know that the part numbers I'm interested in in this case are going to be the ones where there are two values there. So I check the length of the array. If there's, if it's two, then I know that's a gear ratio uh, pair. So I pull that out. Um, and that's basically all I need to get my answer. So once I have all those gear ratio pairs, uh, I'm doing a map operation here, just go through the list, multiply together each pair, and then sum together everything at the end. That's it. So yeah, not terribly complicated. The second part doesn't, doesn't really up the ante a huge amount. It just sort of changes the problem a little bit. Um, I had to do a slight modification here on how I was modeling my data, but it didn't really, it wasn't really a massive, <laughs> didn't really change it in any material way. I could have ended up, I could have implemented this way in the first place had I been thinking like, oh, maybe we'll have to do something with the exact symbol. Um, but I didn't because I didn't really think of it. Um, but it was not terribly complicated to go back and change that after the fact. So that's that. 
yeah, this is definitely the most complicated problem we've had so far. I'd say it's one of the more complicated problems um, it, that I've seen, ever seen in the early days of uh, of these um, puzzles. So, yeah, uh, a little bit. Maybe it's a good sign. Maybe tomorrow will be very easy again. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. I honestly have uh, lost my ability to predict at this stage, so I have no idea what we're looking for, what we'll be expecting for tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, uh, this was... A little bit complicated. I hope this has helped some, anyone who might have struggled a little bit with thinking about this problem. Uh, I'm afraid this isn't the cleanest code in my explanation. Maybe it was a little bit rambly. Um, but yeah, this wasn't the easiest one for me either. So I got there in the end. Um, have a solution. And yeah, that's it. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow for day four. All right.